How can I be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees? The Sermon on the Mount, Part 8. Hi, welcome to today's little lesson, and thank you so very much for joining me once again. We're journeying through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, having a lovely time. If you miss the first seven little lessons on this series, in this series, be great if you'd go back and watch those first. I mean, what have you got to lose? Okay, so important, that very first one, the introduction, laid a foundation, but we've been actually kind of building on that foundation, but at the same time still laying a foundation. I would say that not until we get to verse 21 are we past Jesus' introduction to the sermon, because Jesus was a great communicator. There was a logic, a rationale behind what he said and how he said it and in what order he said things in this sermon. And so it builds and later verses are relevant to, you know, earlier verses. Okay, just as most preachers and teachers do in their sermons, Jesus was at least that smart. All right. And so last time we finished out in this pivotal section, I would say Matthew 5, 17 through verse 20, 17, 18, 19, 20. Those four verses are pivotal. pivotal. That, that, that's when the whole sermon begins to shift and, and uh, not shift, but, but that's when Jesus, be, he lays the foundation all the way through verse 20, clears up some early misconceptions, encourages his followers that they're on the right track, admonishes them to stay on the right track, um, just flat out denies that even though his teaching is so different than the scribes and Pharisees, he, he's not in any way come to abolish the law or the prophets, which pretty much sums up, you know, all of the Old Testament revelation that we call our Old Testament. Didn't come to abolish. I came to fulfill. And we talk on the last little lesson about how fulfill, that's a great English translation of the Greek word play roo, that means to fill to the full. You've got a net that's full of fish. You can cram a few more in there. That's play roo. You've got a depression in the ground that someone's filled up to level off and it's still not quite leveled. So you're just going to level it off. Play roo. Fulfill. Fill to the full. And so you see Jesus is not eradicating. He's taking that from what, again, Jesus is the one who inspired the Mosaic law you know, and, and all the prophets. Okay, so he, he's not going to come and say, well, I'm abolishing all that because I've, I've got a better understanding now. <laughs> you know, God doesn't get a better understanding. <laughs> and, and, and so he's not going to abolish it. I'm just going to fill it to the full. And does that mean that he's going to add to it? Could be, you know, add, add to their understanding of it. I think that would be right. I think it also could imply that the scribes and Pharisees, who he's going to be correcting all through this sermon, had kind of scooped some things out of the net, thrown a few fish overboard, and she said, I'm putting them fish back in there, you know. And, and so we're going to fill it back up because the scribes and Pharisees have been have actually diminished it and reduced it to what God ultimately originally intended. Okay, so I didn't come to abolish, but to fill to the full. And then she said, all that's going to be relevant until heaven and earth pass away. We covered that. And then he said, you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Here's how to do it. Teach and uh, keep and teach the commandments. And he, uh, I think there's little doubt that he was referring to the 613 commandments that we find in the Mosaic Law, which are, of course, co confirmed and affirmed in various ways in the prophets as well as in the historical books. God didn't change in that time. Absolute morality is always absolute morality. It's always been wrong to commit adultery. It will always be wrong to commit adultery. It's always been wrong to lie. It will always be wrong to lie. It is always wrong to steal. It will always be wrong to steal, okay? It will always be right to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It will always be right to love your neighbor as yourself. And so even though we know that as New Covenant believers, we're not under any longer the law of Moses, we are under the law of Christ. And we will eventually look at a passage where this is made 
indisputable by something that Paul said. In fact, I'll just allude to it right now, where when Paul was talking to the Corinthians and, and he said, you know, I'm, when, when I'm around the Jews, I, I, I act as if I'm under the Mosaic law as they are, because I don't want to cause them to stumble or set up a wall or a barrier. He says, but I, I'm not under the law of Moses. I, I know that. He said, but, but I'm not without, not, not, not that I don't have any law. He said, I'm under the law of Christ. Okay, and that's, so that's what Paul believed. Now, the early church, of course, didn't have that revelation. The early church was all Jews, and they all were striving to some degree anyways to keep the law of Moses. Jesus kept the law of Moses perfectly. That's the example that they saw set before them. And Jesus said on his way out, he said to his disciples, I got a lot of things I want to tell you, but you're not ready to receive it yet. Well, what, what, what would one of those things have been? There were a number of things. He said, I've got lots to tell you, but you can't receive it yet. Well, what do you think one of those things would have been? Well, one of those things would have been, we're, 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 we're not under the law anymore of Moses. I've now come in with the law of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. There's overlap between the law of Christ and the law of Moses. Sure there is. You know, we're about to read, Jesus endorsed um, the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, that's, that's under the law of Christ, right? Sure it is. Christians aren't supposed to commit adultery. And, and so there's overlap from the law of Moses. Oh, I might say, you know, the, the commandment to not commit adultery, you, you, you realize that we can read of pagan Gentiles in the Old Testament who understood that even before God gave the law of Moses to the people of Israel exclusively. So within their conscience, God has, to a degree, written ethical and moral law. And again, there's examples of this in Genesis of pagan, you know, leaders who had no law of Moses. Law of Moses wasn't coming for, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and it wasn't coming to them ever in their lifetime or even to their people in their lifetime, you know, or their ancestors' lifetime. It was given exclusively to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God wrote these laws in people's hearts. And so adultery was wrong before the law of Moses. It was wrong in the law of Moses. It's, of course, wrong under the law of Christ. So there's this moral and ethical principles have just carried right on to, into the law of Christ. But there are a few unique things in the law of Christ, like going to all the world, Make disciples, baptize them. You don't find any of that, you know, in the in the in the law of Moses. So there are some unique things, and we also know that Jesus declared all foods clean. Well, there, that's good to know. Okay, that's contained in Scripture. You say, well, he didn't declare all foods clean here. That's right. As I said in our last lesson, this is not a treatise, you know, or a doctoral thesis on the Christian's relationship to the law of Moses. He's talking to people who were under the law of Moses. He hasn't died yet, and and he, 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 he's just trying to get them back up to zero because of all the neg negative teaching and false teaching that they had been brain-dirtied with all their lives by the scribes and Pharisees. Just trying to get them back up there to realize, hey, you know, you ought to be following God's commandments. And there are greater ones and there are lesser ones. And you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Well, keep and teach them. But if you're going to annul... Some of the lesser commandments, well, that, that actually doesn't get you, you know, points. <laughs> it gets you negative points, and you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that a little bit of a comfort, though, you know, that that um, you can still get to heaven and, and annul the lesser commandments? Now, can you get to heaven and annul the greater commandments? We're about to find out. Because in the rest of the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus doesn't focus on the lesser commandments. He focuses on the major commandments, things like our relationships with each other and uh, sexual morals and telling the truth. Okay, you're not gonna find him saying, now you heard it said, you know, don't wear a cloth that's mixed of two different kinds of fabrics and don't ever, you know, don't ever boil a kid in its mother's milk. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to re recognize that those are minor 
commandments compared to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and do not commit adultery, and do not steal, and do not bear false witness, and those ones, okay, those are the biggie ones. All right, now we're moving on to the fourth of these four pivotal verses in the Sermon on the Mount. This is so important that we get this, and this verse been so twisted by folks, and I'm about to untwist it here. Matthew 5.20, it begins with the word for. So that, that means it's related to what Jesus has been saying. This is not a new topic. Um, elucidating, expanding on what I've been talking about. What I've been, what I've been talking about, I've been talking about the importance of keeping God's commandments and how, uh, you know, um, I, I'm not abolishing them, I'm fulfilling them, fulfilling everything, you know, uh, in, in the law and the prophets. Uh, you want to be great, keep the commandments, and it says to keep the greater ones, and then four. Because why, 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 why is all that so important? Because here's the here's what Jesus has actually been leading up to. Uh, this is not you know in, a, in an order of you know ascendancy. This is actually a descendancy. This is ascendancy. It's getting more important as it keeps going. And the, here's the final point that everything that, that was before that supports this. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, can we all agree that Jesus just said something about what you must do or must not do, the, a, a behavioral standard that exists for entering the kingdom of heaven? Can we agree on that? Can we just be honest and just say, that's what Jesus said? You know, that, that, that's so irrefutable. That, that's exactly why some people have gone to the incredible extremes of coming up with a theology that abolishes everything that Christ said, saying that it's not relevant to New Testament Christians. And they'll say, Jesus was speaking to Jews under the law. Back in those days, you know, they were saved by keeping the Mosaic law. We were saved by, by grace through faith in Christ. And so this does, it's not relevant to us. But be very careful in saying that because it was Christ who was speaking. And there's no record ever that Jesus took this back or, 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 or said, you know, this is only temporary. You, you can't find it in the epistles anywhere where any apostle said what Jesus said is now no longer relevant because he was ministering to Jews under the Old Covenant. That is the concoction, a theory of human beings that is unsupported completely by the New Testament. And it's actually heresy, and it's actually blasphemy, because you are denying the lordship of Christ. That, that the one who gives commandments, you're saying we don't have to obey Christ's commandments. There is no standard of righteousness because it's by grace. Oh my goodness. Well, that's not in the Bible anywhere. And this, you know, there is a standard. There is a standard. And and, and Paul, you know, enumerates portions of that standard at times in his epistles, as do the other writers of the New Testament letters. You see, people are mistaken that they, 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 oftentimes when you hear people teach about grace, they, they define it as they say it. And they'll talk about the unconditional grace of God. So, that, so again, they're, they're defining the grace of God. It's unconditional. And, and, and in fact, they'll go so far as to say, you know, grace is unconditional. So we're, we're not adding to the definition of grace. We're just simply, you know, making sure everyone understands what grace is. You know, grace is unconditional. If it has conditions, it's not grace. And that's the, that's the underlying premise behind mounds of false teaching. So let me just blow that out of the water before we move on. So, we, you know, we're not carrying that misconception with us through the rest of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Grace is not always unconditional. In fact, most, if not all, grace is always conditional. That's the purpose of grace. 
All right, now what do I mean by that? Well, let's just take forgiveness, for example. Would you consider the act of forgiveness an act of grace? You know, is it deserved favor, earned favor, or is it undeserved favor? Because that's what grace is, undeserved favor. So when someone forgives another person, well, let's just take it from God. When God forgives someone, would you say that that's an act of grace or an expression of grace on God's part, an expression of undeserved favor? Uh, I heard you. You said yes. <laughs> I knew you'd say yes. Okay. All right. So is that is God's grace and forgiveness conditional or unconditional? Well, Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you of your transgressions. So Jesus said that the grace of forgiveness from God is conditioned upon our forgiving our brother from our heart. So that just right there proves that all grace is not unconditional. Most grace is conditional. If you get pulled over by a policeman or a police person for speeding, and the police person says, I'm going to show you grace this time, Mr. Smith, and I'm just going to give you a warning. So be careful from now on uh, and be thankful that this time I didn't give you a ticket because a speeding ticket, you know, would have been $300, a $300 fine. And you say, well, thank you so much for that grace, officer. And then you push your accelerator to the floor and your tires squeal and you race off down the highway. And within you know 10 seconds, you're going 100 miles an hour. You're going to find out about whether or not all grace is conditional or unconditional very quickly. Because just because that, that police officer showed you grace and didn't give you a ticket with the accompanying fine doesn't guarantee that he will not in the future give you a ticket with an accompanying fine. He showed you grace hoping you'd improve your behavior and stop speeding, that you'd be scared of getting caught because you know you just barely, the only reason you didn't get the fine the last time is because of the grace of the police officer, but not all police officers are always so gracious. You got that? <laughs> Could it possibly be that the grace that God showed us is like that grace? Well, if you've ever read the New Testament, you know that's exactly like the grace that God has shown us. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, The grace of a God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and to live holy and righteous, you know, and so forth, and sensibly in this present age. And he goes on and on, elaborating on that theme, that God's grace is a call to repent. God's grace is a temporary opportunity to repent and be born again and be forgiven and be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So from then on, you can do much better than you've been doing before your repentance <laughs> by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's the grace of God. So Jesus said there's a standard. Vague, a vague standard here, but there's a standard. My followers, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter heaven. Even if right now you're among the blessed, because I just enumerated the Beatitudes and told you how you could ascertain whether you're blessed or not. And maybe many of you, you know, it was affirmed to you that you're among the blessed because you're being persecuted and you're pure in heart and you're gentle and, and you hunger and thirst after righteousness and all those things. You're blessed. But if your righteousness doesn't exceed the scribes and Pharisees, you will not, that's future salvation, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now then, some will be quick to say, oh, praise God, I know the answer to all this. Uh, our righteousness does exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us. And so when God looks at me, he sees Christ. It doesn't make a difference how I live my life, how many sins I commit, what I do, because salvation is by grace. Oh, there's that unconditional grace again. And God sees me in Christ, and he doesn't see my sin. Well, you ought to read then Revelation chapter 2 and 3 and ask yourself the question, when Jesus uh, talked to the seven churches in Asia, did he see them you know, with the imputed righteousness of Christ, or did he see them as they really were? <laughs> and you will quickly understand that a lot of teaching about the imputed righteousness of Christ is nothing but just made up baloney. <laughs>
Read Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Not a word there about Jesus seeing anybody, you know, with imputed righteousness. <clears throat> and to think that that's what Jesus was actually alluding to here, that, you know, telling his folks, well, unless your righteousness exceeds that of Christ and Pharisees, you're not going to enter heaven. I'm not going to tell you this, but when I die in, you know, two more years or three years or whatever it is, then you, you'll be able to get the imputed righteousness. And, and so no matter how you live then, then uh, you, yes, you're going to be, be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, but, but I can't reveal that now. So uh, you'll just have to be deceived by me right now because I've just misled you. I, every, everybody in the audience right now is thinking, I got to live more righteously. Pra my practical righteousness has got to exceed the scribes and Pharisees or I will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what every person in that audience of perhaps thousands of people thought when they heard Jesus say that that day. And so if, and if that's the impression that they had, which they no doubt did, Jesus misled them if, in fact, he, it, what he really had in mind was the imputed righteousness will surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. So you're making Jesus a deceiver to all those people. And, and, and contextually, keep reading the Sermon on the Mount. You won't find anything about the imputed righteousness of Christ. <laughs> you know, that's not what he was talking about. He's talking about your actual, actual behavior. As John would one day say in his epistle, he that practices righteousness is righteous, trying to clear up some of the goofy you know, ideas in his day that exist in our day as well, that I can live any way I want because Christ's righteousness has been imputed to me. No, Christ has become our righteousness. Here's how. Christ has become our righteousness in that he bore our sin in his body on the cross, and he suffered for our sins, paying the, you know, the, 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 paying the penalty that we deserve for our sin. And through that sacrificial death, God offers to everyone who will turn from the rebellion, turn from you know, their sin as much as they can. And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, which means, of course, making him Lord. So this is a complete change of heart on the part of those people. That's the deal God's offer. If you'll do that, I will forgive all your former sins by virtue of Christ's death and your faith. So you know, if there's any imputed righteousness, well, there it goes into work right there. You know, your sins are all forgiven because Christ paid the price for them. Okay? But Christ also becomes our righteousness in another part of salvation. He comes to live in us to live through us, to empower us, to obey God and live righteously. It doesn't make us robots, but gives us a tremendous capacity to, to do what God wants us to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. Paul talked about that. We can walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. And so Christ in us then becomes our righteousness. Why am I holy? Well, it's not because so much of me, although I do play a part, but Christ in me, he's my righteousness and he's living through me. And so if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now you think, well, boy, how, how righteous were they? Because I want to make sure that I do better than them. And guess what? Jesus knew you'd ask that question, and that's the next thing he went into. And he, he stayed with it for the whole rest of the chapter and the next chapter, basically, of his sermon. Talking about, well, here's what the scribes and Pharisees, here's how they're doing. But this is what I expect of you to exceed their righteousness. And I'm not giving you any new commandments. I'm giving you the same commandments that they have, but they've twisted and twisted them. Now I'm untwisting them. And we'll talk about this in our you know, coming little lessons. And we'll see how beautifully Jesus did that to help them to answer the question in their minds. Well, if my righteousness has got to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, what does that mean practically and specifically in my life? What must I do? And as you read through this, you begin to realize that it's actually not all that hard to be do better than the scribes and Pharisees because they were such miserable, scripture-twisting, 
rebellious wretches, religious dudes, you know, who really didn't have the Holy Spirit and hearts full of darkness and so forth. And so it's actually not all that hard to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, particularly with the help of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so it just keeps getting better and better. And uh, I hope you'll stick with me in the weeks ahead as we continue our study through the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so we're about out of time for today, but I hope I've given you a setup for next time as we dive into Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 21, where Jesus begins talking about, here's what scribes and Pharisees have conveyed to you, but here's what God wanted to convey to you, and here's what I'm conveying to you now because I happen to be God. <laughs> That's what Je I'm speaking on Jesus' behalf now. All righty. Hey, uh, here's my final word, uh, and I know that people hear me say this every time, and if you do, I hope you've acted on it. Uh, come take a look at one of our two very important websites, heavensfamily.org. I've been directing Heaven's Family for two decades now. I personally have traveled in about 80 countries of the world and ministered in about 40 of them. We've done projects in, I think, close to 80 project up countries of the world, helping the least of these and expanding God's kingdom with the help. Good folk, just like you. Okay. And lots and lots of ways to get involved in showing Jesus you love him and lots of ways to lay up treasure in heaven and to not give out handouts, but to give hand ups and so forth. And we're serving the least of these in many categories, widows and orphans and folks who are disabled and ill and, and um, you know, helping young girls who have been trafficked and so forth. And um, just a lot of good stuff. And I'm so thankful for our staff and our partners around the world whom we uh, have vetted very well and know and worked with for years. I, I've actually traveled, you know, over a million miles just on one airline, United Airlines. They sent me a little plaque, you know, thank you for a million miles. That's a lot, that's a lot of miles sitting in an airplane seat. But that's all in the process of, um, working for Heaven's Family over the last 20 or so years. Okay, thanks so much for joining me. Until next time, may the Lord continue to bless you.